I am here today to talk to you about something as simple and as obvious as watching movies. Now, that self-deprecating opener is actually at the core of what I want to talk to you about today, which is the validity of film studies as an academic principle. Now, when I moved to London a year ago to study, I went through the relentless process known as Freshers' Week, um, and my thoughts go out to any 18-year-old currently on the tail end of that horrific experience. <laughs> and in this time, I would ask and get asked three different questions. One, where are you from? Two, where are you living? And three, what do you study? Well, firstly, I'm from Bedfordshire, but no one knows what that is, so who cares? <laughs> Secondly, I'm living in South London, and yes, I have no money, and yes, my card got declined buying a sandwich yesterday. <laughs> and thirdly, oh, what do I study? Um, well, um, film studies. I then watched the face of the mechanic, or the lawyer, or the biochemical scientist fall in dismay. And I would get one of three different responses. Firstly, ah, Good for you for doing something you enjoy. That sounds, that sounds so fun, honestly. I wish I could just sit around and watch movies all day. <laughs> Which cuts, but I'll take it, because that is basically why I'm here. <laughs> Secondly, oh, so what job do you want to do with that? Which, again, hurts, because as any BA student will tell you, I have no idea. And the third and most painful of all, oh, so you're doing a DOS degree. DOS meaning a degree just for the sake of a degree, a, a pointless degree. I remember I got asked that by a philosopher, a philosophy student. And I thought, <laughs> I don't specifically remember there being a philosophy industry that's hiring, but whatever. <laughs> but out of a desire to assimilate and make new friends, I went along with it. I said, yeah, you know, you're right. It's a terrible degree. What am I thinking? And then I'd watch them nod a little bit too aggressively in agreement. Like, yeah, no, good luck out there. <laughs> And it was the same at home, friends of my parents asking what the hell I was thinking, people at the pub I worked at venting to me about their son's fine art degree, and then seeing them be visibly relieved that it could be worse because he could be studying film studies instead. <laughs> and this went on and on until eventually I couldn't take it anymore. I like films, and I love film studies, and I couldn't continue to downplay something that I had racked up nearly £60,000 worth of debt to study. And yes, that sentence hurt to say. <laughs> so when I got the opportunity to give a talk, I knew what I wanted to say, because I had essentially already given this talk at pre-drinks across South London. <laughs> but today, I will be giving some supporting information and data to back up my claims. <laughs> so firstly, it's worth considering the burgeoning popularity of cinema. The British Film Institute found that in 2018, there were 177 million cinema admissions. And that's not including films watched at home or on streaming services. Now, despite making nearly £1.3 billion that year alone, the popularity of cinema is very rarely observed for insight. Instead, film studies is considered to academia what white bread is considered to fine dining. It's often scoffed at by university academics who think the only things worth studying are things you would find in a university library on a university reading list. But instead, we have Netflix. And so the popularity of film is often considered a negative. So my particular field of interest in film studies is representation and scholarship. And why is this information important? Well, um, think about film representation. Films in the mainstream have become to represent mainstream, dominant, hegemonic society. And so to see yourself in a film is to be told you exist. It is to be validated in the eyes of billions of viewers who cannot scoff and turn away, but instead will watch you navigate the world being created on screen. Whether that be uh, a popcorn action flick like Captain Marvel or an Oscar-winning drama like Moonlight. Imagine being an LGBT black teenager, watching a film like Moonlight be celebrated with accolades and praise and awards. It's not just validation, it's appraisal. It's being told that these stories aren't just real, they're beautiful. I realize I have this personal relationship with representation for a reason. As an LGBT person that grew up in the literal middle of nowhere, I owe almost everything to queer representation on the screen. Whether that be watching and re-watching a German language film about two teenage long distance runners falling in love, 
uh, or an unspoken gravitation to Kurt and Blaine's romance in season two of Glee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or even fun, non-representational moments, like watching Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed and thinking Daphne's boots were really chic. <laughs> I owe so much to representation because it helped me come to terms with my own identity by seeing it literally unfurl on the screen in front of me. Now, representation has tangible effects in the real world, and to understand these, it's worth looking at more negative impacts. So, for starters, if we look at the beginning of when film became popular, we can see that early films are being used to stir visceral and intense audience reactions. So, for starters, as American films were becoming popular, one of the first feature films was D.W. Griffiths' The Birth of a Nation, a three-hour-long film that valorizes and celebrates the heroic efforts of the Ku Klux Klan. Think about how intense the gaze is that even this early, films were being used to stir intense audience reactions, with the, the Birth of a Nation heavily accredited with growth of KKK popularity in the 1920s. Imagine being a black child watching that film in the 1910s, something so polemic as to valorize the KKK. You can begin to understand just how powerful the gaze is, and that we are each watching our own individual movies simultaneously, steered by our own cultural leanings or personal political beliefs. In the present day, we see representation having positively dangerous reactions. For example, Todd Phillips' Joker film has stirred many a clickbait article and online think piece and embarrassing Halloween costume. But earlier this month at protests in Beirut, people were arriving dressed as the Joker using him as a symbol for dissatisfaction, as a symbol for political rising. Alternatively, incel groups or groups of involuntary celibate men online are using the Joker as their profile picture on social media platforms such as Twitter or Reddit, using him as a symbol while spewing hate speech against women and transgender people. He has come to represent their society. Film representation has such tangible, real-world consequences that the reluctance to study it is baffling. Lest we forget, in 2012, James Holmes walked into a screening of The Dark Knight Rises and shot and killed 12 people, injuring nearly 60 more. And upon his arrest, literally identified himself as the Joker. So what is it about representation in film that has such intense personal reactions? Well, it's not necessarily that the Joker is supposed to represent these groups of people, but that they feel represented by him. It's the perfect alignment of formal choices, of content, of his primary color suit, of cult film iconography, of references to Martin Scorsese films. All of these things coalesce and speak to such a specific present-day niche that despite just being another comic book film, Joker has gone on to be one of the most hotly debated and controversial films this year. So what do we do with this information? Well, we can use it to encourage producers and filmmakers to tell more interesting stories, to hire new perspectives and voices, to become more woke or socially liberal and progressive. After all, film has a unique opportunity to be both diverse and representational in its hiring and in its depictions. But specifically in regards to film spectatorship and studies, film is unique in its approach to representation because unlike other art forms, it's a literal example of seeing oneself. Public opinion can be informed by literal observation, with the cinema screen acting like a window into the lives of the misunderstood or the underrepresented. And these images are powerful, despite being just projected on the wall in a cinema, because they are representing our own experiences, but in new and different ways. Now, this representation might not always be positive or life-changing, or progressive, it might be remissive, it might be tokenistic, it, it might be disgusting. But the specific way that film form can affect public opinion and society at large is worth studying.
because then we can begin to understand the way that art forms are forming and are formed by culture. And then when we understand this information, we can begin to take positive movements to both prevent and allow representation to affect our lives in a positive way. And even giving this talk today, I felt shame that it wasn't as valid or as worthwhile as the other talks. And you know what? Watching movies probably isn't as important as performing heart surgery in space. I'll say it. <laughs> but that doesn't mean what I'm saying doesn't have any value. In a way, by voicing this desire to validate film studies, I am voicing my own desire to value the studying of art forms. In a way, this talk is my own act of unlearning those prejudices against my own degree. <laughs> so next time I'm at a party of a friend of a friend, and someone comes up to me and says, oh, so what do you study? I'll look them directly in the eye, <laughs> and I'll take a deep breath, and I will lie and tell them I do computer science. <laughs> Just kidding. I will tell them that I do film studies. And they will ask why, and I will say why, and they won't care. And it won't seem like it matters. It won't seem like it matters until that person or someone they care about sees themselves on screen and finally feels at home. And they will ask me how that happened. Thank you. <laughs>